Hi, my name is Jean Caldera. I'm a postdoc at Fermilab. And I want to tell you about some work we've done recently comparing different methods of quantifying uncertainties if you're using a deep learning algorithm. This was work done with Brian Ord, uh, and you can find it in an archive at the link below. So deep learning is used in a lot of things, image classification, self-driving cars, but also it's gaining more and more uses in cosmology and the physical sciences in general. And in those sciences, whenever we have a result, we need to have an uncertainty measure to know how much we should trust it. And we need that uncertainty measurement to be interpretable in terms that we are familiar with. And we need to trust it. So there have been many methods that have come out in the last few years, partly because we're not the only field that needs uncertainties in their results. There are some names here. If you've heard of them, then great. If you haven't, then I'll tell you a little bit about them later. But which one should you use if you're using deep learning and something is not immediately clear. Furthermore, even if you just take one of these off the shelf and start using it in your application, you might find terms that you don't immediately recognize. Namely, uncertainty in deep learning is usually divided into these two names, aleatoric and epistemic. And I had not heard about these terms before starting to work on this project. So aleatoric uncertainty is uncertainty that's related to the to corruption of input data. Maybe you have detector noise or, or the point spread, spread function in astrophysical data. So it's data that it's a type of uncertainty that you cannot reduce no matter how good your model is. It's just part of the data. There's no way to make a better measurement. And epistemic uncertainty, which is related to how good your model is. Maybe you're not sure which param how good this parameter is, and that relates to epistemic uncertainty. And that can be reduced if you get more and more data. If you learn more about your problem, the epistemic uncertainty will go down. On the other hand, in physical sciences and physics, namely, we usually divide uncertainty into statistical and systematic. One is uncertainty that can be statistically determined from your input data. And systematic uncertainty is just something that is not statistical. It may come from theory or from uh, some other measurement that you're using. And if you compare these two, uh, you can convince yourself that there's no way to have statistical epistemic uncertainty. You can't have something that comes from the statistics of your input data, but is somehow related to your model. But every other combination is possible, namely epistemic, systematic. If you have something from your model, I just argue it's systematic. If you have statistical spread in your input data, that creates some noise that you cannot help. So it's al that's aleatoric uncertainty. But you also have systematic aleatoric uncertainties. There might be something in your input data that you cannot necessarily calculate its effect from just calculating the standard deviation of some measurements. So the problem summary I've hinted at that we are trying to tackle is this. If you have a deep learning algorithm, you've trained it, you have a nice result, but you want to have some uncertainty quantification, which of these methods should you choose? And then when you get the results, how do you interpret them? They're in terms of things that you might not have heard about, how do you make sense of these things? And what we've done is to build a simple sandbox with a pendulum problem, so data that any physicist in principle should understand or be familiar with. And so we just uh, make create mock data and mock measurements of what would happen if we had a pendulum data in different environments. And we measured uh, LT the mass of the pendulum and the initial angle of oscillation with different environments that have different Gs, different accelerations. So given these measurements, so to be more concrete, we have one measurement, one mock measurement of LM theta and 10 measurements of the period of the pendulum. We input this into a neural network with three hidden layers that have 100 nodes each. And we try to learn 
we try to teach the machine learning method to predict from that data the gravitational acceleration g and some uncertainty sigma g. I'll explain in a minute how we train the method to, to fit those two parameters. So in this, uh, the, one of the reasons this problem is very nice is that we can introduce noise that corresponds to the different types of uncertainty that I talked about in the beginning. So you can in, introduce statistical aleatoric uncertainty by adding noise to the measurements of the period. Since we have 10 measurements of the period, we can just uh, look at the distribution of measurements of the period and uh, from that see how the measurement of g should be affected. So that's statistical aleatoric uncertainty. And here we're just going to, when I say add noise, I really mean I'm going to sample the measurements from a normal distribution around their true value. And the standard deviation of that normal distribution is, is controlled, is uh, sampled from a given distribution for each point. And we'll see when we look at the results how widely this distribution needs to vary to, for the machine learning method to learn this. The systematic aleatoric uncertainty is where we add noise to the single L measurement. It's still, we're still adding noise to the data, but now it's systematic because there's only one L measurement. So the data you have doesn't allow you to make any statements about how bad or good your measurement of L is. And uh, epistemic uncertainty arises if you test we could do this in different ways. One way to do it would be to reduce the amount of training data you have, for example. But a simple way to do it where you don't need to train many different models is to just go away from your training set distribution. So if you train in a given region, just try to evaluate the model a little farther away and see how well or how badly you're doing. And if that is uh, reflected in the uncertainties that the model outputs. I should also note, uh, in case anyone is, is feeling that this is a little ridiculous, that this is really not the type of problem you should apply deep learning to. It's a, mo it's a problem where you have inputs and you have an analytic equation that relates the output to the input. So you shouldn't, you, if you're you tr thinking of using deep learning for something, it should probably be something where you don't have an analytic relation that you could just use. The advantage of this is that it, it's a little bit of a toy problem. And so in particular, it allows us to introduce noise, as I hinted, and then propagate uncertainties to the result. And then we can compare the uncertainties that we propagated to the uncertainties that the machine learning models output. So as I showed you when I showed the neural network, we're going to optimize g and sigma, two values. And we're going to optimize them to maximize the, the Gaussian log likelihood of the right answer. So given the right answer, which we know, what are the g and sigma g, how, what are the g and sigma g that we can predict from the inputs that would maximize the likelihood of the data if, if g and sigma g define a Gaussian uh, normal distribution. And that is equivalent, so maximizing that log likelihood is equivalent to minimizing this loss function. So you can see that the second term here tries to bring g close to the true value and sigma g, and if it can't bring it close to the true value, then it wants to make sigma g larger, but then the first term wants to make sigma g smaller. And in all of, so this is going to be true for all the methods, and this sigma g is going to be the estimate of the aleatoric uncertainty that comes from the data. And then we're going to obtain predictions from slightly different models for all methods, and the variation between the predictions of these different models is what gives us an estimate of the epistemic uncertainty, the uncertainty of how good or how certain we are about this model. How we obtain these different models from which we draw predictions is what's different between the three methods. So the different methods are deep ensembles, which is the conceptually simplest model where we just, we're just going to train a bunch of models independently with different initializations. 
we train the models on the same data, but since there's some randomness in the, in the initialization and also in the order in which the models see the data, the models will be slightly different at the end and will give slightly different predictions. And how different those predictions are gives us some idea of how sure we are about the, the model that's the right model for the job. Concrete dropout. So dropout is a technique that's usually used to avoid overfitting in machine learning. But essentially, it means you, you drop a few neurons in, in each layer of the neural network with some probability. And which neurons you drop uh, varies from, time, from every time you run through the network. Typically, that's something that's only used in training the neural network. And then when testing, you take away the dropout. Concrete dropout is a technique where you keep the dropout in testing as well. And you optimize the probabilities of dropping any given neuron at any given layer during training so that the prob the, those probabilities are the right ones so that when you run the same input through the model dropping out different neurons, you get the spread that corresponds to the epistemic uncertainty. And Bayesian neural networks are the third method we'll be using here. And they're a very, I think, sort of natural idea, especially maybe for cosmologists, where instead of having the connections between neurons, which are called weights, uh, be just numbers, we're going to let them be Gaussian distributions with the mean and the standard deviation. And we're going to optimize both the mean and standard deviation when we get the training data to get a good distribution of outputs that reflects the noise in the, in the training. And when we run, so we can here get a spread of predictions by running the same input through the Bayesian neural networks while sampling different things from these Gaussian distributions. And that gives us a spread of predictions that, again, gives us a measure of how sure we are about the model. So those are the three different methods. So how well do they do? So the first test is to just put in aleatoric uncertainty. So to just put in some noise in T in the 10 measurements of the period. We can propagate the uncertainty in the period to an uncertainty in G through the usual linear uh, propagation formula that we do in experimental physics classes. Of course, that formula is an approximation, but it's fairly close since we're not putting in that much noise. So not a lot of uh, error comes from that. It just makes the method simpler. And so the first thing we did was put in noise, so for every input point, we draw a number uniformly between 1 and 5%. And then we draw the 10 measurements of t from a Gaussian that is uh, that has that spread around the true value. 1 to 5% of the true value is the standard deviation of a Gaussian. And we expected the aleatoric uncertainty that comes out of the machine learning models to somewhat follow the trend of the actual analytic uncertainty. So here on this plot, on the x-axis, you see the estimate of the analytic estimate of the uncertainty. I say relative because it's the ratio of uncertainty to value. So on the x-axis, you have the analytic estimate. And on the y-axis, you have the uncertainty estimate that comes out of the machine learning model. And you can see that all three methods we've tried in this problem, for this problem, predict a constant relative uncertainty. So for any input point, no matter how much noise the measurements of t have, they always predict exactly the same uncertainty. We thought this might be because maybe the range of uncertainties in t was not quite wide enough. So we tried, well, what if we instead sample for each point 1 to 10? And you can see that as we increase the, num the amount of different noise, the, the not just increase the amount of noise, but increase how varied the amount of noise is between data points to so 1 to 10 percent. Deep ensembles and concrete dropout now uh, follow the trend of, our, of the analytic estimate, while Bayesian neural networks stayed uh, 
constant. So is this a problem always for Bayesian neural networks? Well, of course, we can still increase from 1 to 10 to something larger. So we tried, what if we go really crazy and make the measurements of T have a Gaussian noise of up to 20%? for each data point. And now the Bayesian neural networks start to really follow the trend of the analytic estimate. And uh, of course, there's more noise, so the ranges of these plots increase as you go further to the right. So the next test we wanted to do is how well are the epistemic uncertainties reflected? And there are several ways to go out of distribution. So we trained on Gs that vary from 5 to 15 meters per second square. So we can go, uh, what if we go to 15 to 20 and test there and see how the models do? And what we see immediately is, one, the predictions are terrible. The, the models are very conservative and just predict a steady about 15 meters per second, the highest range in the training set. That's fair. We didn't expect the models, the models to do very well. You should never ask a model to extrapolate. But the whole point here was, does the model know that it's extrapolating? Does it know enough to say, I don't know what you're asking me to predict? And what we found is that, no, the, the epistemic uncertainties don't really rise that much as you get farther from the trading distribution. So let's try something a little bit easier. What if instead we keep the output inside the trading distribution, so G, stays in the 5 to 15, but we can move L and T out of the training distribution. So we train L between 0.2 and 0.8 meters per second, no, sorry, meters, and uh, we can just move it up from that training range and see whether the models know that hmm, this looks a bit different from what you showed me and uh, the epistemic uncertainty should rise. So that, at the very least, you want it to go up, even if it doesn't reflect how bad the model is doing, because you want to be able to tell, oh, this, this is a point where the model thinks things are going strange, so maybe let's not use the model. And you can see that for both deep ensembles and Bayesian neural networks, the estimate of the epistemic uncertainty starts to rise as you move further away from the training set. Whereas concrete dropout just gives even the 84th percentile, which is the highest thing I show here, is just plain zero, even for double the maximum L in the training distribution. And that's because this is such an easy problem that the concrete dropout probabilities optimize to very, very small values. So barely any neuron, if any neuron at all, is being dropped. For, for every forward pass we do through the network. So even if we do 10 different forward passes, we get essentially zero, pro zero probability of any neuron being dropped. And so the predictions are always exactly the same, which gives us zero epistemic uncertainty. So that's pretty bad <laughs> as, as, as it goes. If you have an easy problem in the training set, concrete dropout will not know it when you go out of it. Uh, so we could still ask for the other two where the uncertainties start to go up. Do they go up enough to reflect how badly the model is doing? And so this is what happens in the training set. So this is a plot where on the x-axis we draw different confidence intervals around each prediction, or rather prediction intervals around each prediction that the model makes, and we ask for a given width of a confidence interval, how often do the predictions, or how often do the true values follow inside that interval? And so you expect that, say, for a one sigma interval, 68% of the points will fall inside that interval, and so forth. So, and you can see that for all models, these lines follow the one-to-one -one trend, which is what you'd want. They all are a little above the one-to-one -one trend, but not by a huge amount in the training set. As you move a little farther from the training set, 0.8 to 1.2, deep ensembles and Bayesian neural networks are still fairly well calibrated, whereas the uh, concrete dropout, because the uncertainties are not going up, 
are just now quite underestimated. And the proportion of points inside the interval is quite low compared to what it should be. And if you go even farther away from the training set, you start to see that all models start to have pretty, under, pretty underestimated uncertainties and concrete dropout is starting to be very, very underestimated. So those are our conclusions, essentially. So for the first test of aleatoric uncertainties, they are reasonably well modeled, we saw, but you do need to be careful when you're training to make sure that the uncertainties in your training set are varied enough to, so that the model learns how to predict them for different input points and not just to give the same answer for every point. This is something that we kind of know that machine learning models do for predictions. If your training set doesn't have enough variation, the model will first just learn to predict probably the mean of your training set and sort of ignore the inputs. But that's something you will spot immediately if your model is just giving you the mean of your training set. But if your model doesn't quite give you the right uncertainties, it's not obvious that you'll spot this. And so because you don't have in the usual problem, you don't have the true uncertainty. And so it's important to be careful here. In particular, if all you do is a test, like we've the one I showed you in the last slide, these calibration plots, they look really good even if all you have is constant uncertainties, regardless of your input. The other thing we saw is that out of distribution is hard for all the problems, in particular concrete dropout. Uh, was a disaster and just gave zero for all uh, points, al or almost all points, I should say. Uh, but, and, but even the other models, the other methods were underestimated if you go far away enough. So that's a, still a hard problem that probably needs more work. So deep ensembles is both technically the simplest method to use. You're just training a bunch of networks. And it's also the best performant in the state of the art. One disadvantage of deep ensembles is that you need more computation because you need to train more models. But they're also easier to fit than Bayesian neural networks on concrete dropout. So there's a little more computation, but maybe not as much as you would think. And in fact, there are also techniques arising to be able to make ensembles without training completely different networks. And those are under development. Thank you.